decision making it's just common sense but in reality that is indeed our problem because we simply think it is good common sense Lee Iacocca, presidential candidate and former president of Chrysler Corporation, said one time, The greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance. It is the illusion of knowledge. Most of us believe, when it comes to decision making, we're pretty good at what we do. And that illusion is dangerous, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to take a look at this. But let's first ask ourselves, how do we make decisions? Undoubtedly, it is based on interpretation of data and information, based on things like intuition, experience, perception, judgment, gut feel, etc. Right? No doubt about all that. But behind all these are three important traits. Perception, probability, and our logic. So perception is how we see the world. Probability is the certainty of the data or the uncertainty of the data. And logic is, of course, how each of us interpret this day. Let's see if this is true. Take a look at this picture. What do you see? A frog. Yes, you're correct. It is a frog. But someone else might see a horse. Just rotate this counterclockwise 90 degrees. So be very careful. Different people will perceive the same thing differently. How relevant is this? Derek Antel, a New York plastic surgeon, studied the jawlines of Fortune 500 company CEOs. He found something extraordinary, that 90% of the top CEOs had a prominent chin versus 40% for the general population. This defies logic. When only 40% of the population has a protruding chin, how is it that 90% of the top CEOs had this prominent chin? He went on to look at their heights and he found that only about 14% of white males in the US are six-footers. Yet nearly 60% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies are white and they are tall. So we have an interesting conclusion. If you wish to be a candidate for CEO of a Fortune 500 company in the USA, you must be white, you must be male, at least six foot tall and yes, must have a long chin. Well, the real reason behind all of this is perception. Selection committees, board of directors, chairmen all have this view of what a typical CEO should look like. A false perception, unfortunately, but a reality. Let's look at probability. Every decision or prediction we make is based on the likelihood of an event happening and or when that event would occur. Do you agree? Think about it. When heading to work, we might consider taking an umbrella, but that decision is based on our assessment of the probability or the likelihood of rain. So once again, every decision or prediction we make is based on this likelihood. However, this probability is either a logical assessment, we like to call it a guess, or a mathematical or statistical assessment. Let's think about it. What are these mathematical assessments? The weatherman predicting rain or snow, he actually bases it on statistical data. An insurance company determining premiums, once again, historical data. A company offering warranties on an equipment. Even an army estimating the expected number of deaths in a war. Planes, for example, are subject to a service schedule based on equipment failure statistics. Factor of safety in engineering designs. Locating a retail store or branch office based on probable traffic. Even a company deciding on the best time to release a movie or introduce a product makes certain assessments. Betting, lottery pricing and casino winnings etc. all based on mathematical assessments. On the other hand, we also make logical assessments or guesses. When we drive at high speed, we guess that there won't be another vehicle coming in the other direction. Recruiting decisions. 
public opinion on decisions made by politicians. Even agencies such as the CIA and FBI almost always operate on probabilities. Companies negotiating with unions will consider the likelihood of a strike. Candidates seeking elected office, they have to consider the probability of them winning. Even you and I might think, how will my spouse react? Or will my son and daughter be safe? Whether to purchase life insurance, gambling, etc. All of these are certain assessments we make. So do you agree that if you make a bad assessment, or you do not know how to deal with multiple probabilities, you could end up with a suboptimal decision? But in reality, one, your assessment or guess is likely to be wrong. Two, every piece of data you have is X percent correct and 100 minus X percent wrong. And three, most of us do not know how to deal with probabilities. Let me try to explain this with some examples. Mary has 10 lottery tickets priced at $1 each. The winner would get $14. You are allowed to buy only one ticket. Would you buy a ticket? Probably yes or no. But let's take a moment. If I jump in and buy nine of the tickets available, would you buy the last ticket? Pause for a moment and think. In fact, many people in my classes say they wouldn't buy the last ticket because probably I would win. But yet, in reality, odds remains one in ten. It doesn't matter who buys the nine tickets. Let's take a coin toss. Heads, I give you $15. Tails, you give me $10. Would you play? Some might say yes, they would play. Others might say no. But pause for a moment. Let's say you agree to play. We toss it one time. You can't see the result. I can't see the result. We show it to a referee. Would you play a second time without knowing the result of the first play? You might. You might not. I don't know. What about a third time? What about a fourth time? Almost always, after three or four attempts, the person gives up and says, no, I won't play anymore. But in reality, if you toss a coin long enough, there will be 50% heads, 50% tails. So if you tossed it a thousand times, you would win 15,000 and you would give up 10,000. The net is your game. So you should be willing to play as long as I allow you to play. But again, your logic fails you. Right. Let's take a look at an interesting scenario. Behind one of these coins is a valuable gift, let's say a brand new car. Which coin would you pick? Of course, they all have equal probability. So let's say we just pick the blue because it has an equal chance. Now, if that is true, we have two groups, right? There's a group of the red and the green and our blue. Let's open the green. Now we know it's not under the green. Would you change your mind if you're given the opportunity? Go with the red or stick to your blue? Pause for a moment and think. In fact, most people say, I'll stick with my blue. But guess what? When you selected the blue, you had a 33% chance of the gift being under the blue. And there was a 67% chance it could have been in the other lot. That probability of 67% didn't change. Now that you know it's not under the green, you should immediately move to the red because that had the higher probability. But again, our logic failed us. Let's take an interesting case of multiple probabilities. You have been asked to source an important product from one of three countries. Liberia, Congo or Angola. Unfortunately, we understand there are political instabilities that could disrupt supplies. Based just on this information, can we make a common sense decision? 
on the best source? source? No, we need some information. But what kind of information do we need? We would like to know something about the likelihood of these events happening. This is known as event probability. And I'm going to give you this information. Congo riots 25%, Angola coup 30%, Liberia's new government 35%. Can we now make a common sense decision? No, not really. It's like saying there's a 99% chance it's going to rain. Should I take an umbrella? Most people say, yeah, but not really. If I'm going from one underground garage to another underground garage and I'm not impacted by the rain, why should I take an umbrella? So what we need to know is the impact of these events on our particular scenario. So I'm going to give you some data on the impact. So here we have a 25% probability of riots in Congo that has the following impacts, 20%, 50%, and 30% of our contract being fulfilled. So this is a typical scenario. I'll give you data for the other two as well. Now guess what? You have 21 data points, ladies and gentlemen. So I ask you, can you make a common sense decision? No, it's too much information. But I thought you like to make informed decisions and you like information. Sure. But the problem is are not equipped to handle this volume of data. We need some training. Let's take another problem on logic. Linda is 31 years old, single, bright and outspoken. She graduated in philosophy and music. Even as a student, she was convinced that music helped people to stay on the straight and narrow path. No drugs, no gang activities, etc. If I were to ask you, what is Linda's most likely profession? Is she a bank teller or is she a bank teller and a part-time music teacher? A or B? Pause for a moment and think. Once again, most people will say, hmm, she's probably a bank teller and is also a part-time music teacher. But that's not true, ladies and gentlemen. Think about this class. The number of males in this group that is satisfying one condition that they are males will always be greater than the number of males in this group born in this city that is satisfying two conditions. Males born in this city will always be less than the males in this group. Likewise, the likelihood of Linda being a bank teller satisfying one condition will always be more probable than she is a bank teller and a music teacher. So our logic doesn't help us, ladies and gentlemen. Let me give you one last example on logic. In this picture, Roger is married and is looking at Mary. And Mary is looking at David, who is unmarried. So the question is, based just on this information, is a married person looking at an unmarried person? You can say A, yes, B, no, or C, need more information. Now pause for a moment and think. You would probably say, I don't need to think. I need to know if Mary is married or not. Think again. Yeah, you'll say, I need to know if Mary is married or not. But really, you don't need to know. Because if Mary is married, a married person is looking at an unmarried person. If Mary is not married, a married person is still looking at an unmarried person. So as you can see, your logic didn't go far enough. Okay, most of you have bought a house. You and your spouse have retired and you're planning on moving to a more suitable location in the US. How would you go about deciding on a place to live? Obviously, you're going to start with some criteria. Things like, is it a hot place or a cold place? What about home prices, taxes, restaurants? As you age, you want to know about doctor's offices, right? What about crime? What about pollution? Access to family? All of those are important, right? So here are seven cities for which I have factual data given to you. Oops, too much information. Let's not pretend that you can use your common sense and decide where you want to go. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a serious problem. William Sonoma, the kitchen equipment store, they advertised a bread machine for $85 and it did not sell well. 
what did they do rather than remove the product from the shelf they introduced a $135 bread machine and placed it right next to the cheaper unit guess what sales of the cheaper machine increased dramatically people felt they were getting a bargain now they were focusing on which one not whether they even needed a bread machine this is true this happens this was done at MIT we did a study of a safety audit of a refinery we called in a group of engineers seven to ten engineers in each batch and we told them that a refinery audit has informed us there's a 25 percent probability that the refinery would have a fire within the next 12 months the solution is to invest two million dollars and reduce the risk to two percent invest one million dollars to reduce it to five percent but if we only invest half a million dollars the risk would remain at around ten percent and we asked these engineers what level of investment they would go with but we had an interesting strategy we exposed every other group to posters placed strategically along the corridors where they walked in that said refinery fire kills 20 people government fines oil company 20 million dollars for violations of safety etc guess what the groups that saw those posters all went with the two million dollars they did not make the decision we made the decision for them they were primed take a look at this interesting study that was done in Europe countries were asked about organ donations this group seems to be very altruistic and wish to donate their organs while this group does, do not wish to donate their organs here is Sweden and here is Denmark countries next to each other very different behavior here is Austria and here is Germany countries next to each other very different behavior pattern why is that well very simple for this group it said check the box if you wish to donate people didn't check the box and they did not donate for this group it said check the box if you do not wish to donate once again they did not check the box but the, as you can see we can formulate the question to get the result we want to but you keep thinking you're making the decision no we're making the decision for you and you don't even know it let's say this is the year 1950 when we did not have an internet and you're buying a camera guess what you look at some glossy magazines you talk to some friends who have cameras you go to a small shop that has four or five cameras and you buy one but today we go on the internet and we Google and we are faced with information overload plenty of reviews on cameras we go to a shop that has cameras and we are faced with 200 plus cameras or amazon.com wherever it is what we face is choice overload ladies and gentlemen thanks to the internet it is now possible to be extremely well informed and yet make a suboptimal decision at the same time in fact most executives face this problem they have to deal with manpower distribution budget sales transport cash flow share prices and all of these other things they're facing a nightmare how about experience if you think experience is a good guide think about divorce rates in the US in the year 2010 first marriages failed 43 percent of the time armed with a little more experience they'd get married a second time failed 68 percent of the time and of course now that you are so experienced you marry a third time and you fail 74 percent of the time so much for experience so how did we do with common sense well not very convincing right oh yes sure anyone can make a decision and live with the consequences but it would be very difficult to defend such a decision in a corporate setting you agree would you give your car to a mechanic who has not been trained probably not would you go to a dentist who is not trained certainly not then what about untrained decision makers do you rely on untrained decision makers to make crucial decisions so will training help girls who have been working all their lives if they wish to be models still have to learn how to walk elegantly likewise even though you have been making decisions all your life you too need to learn to make better defensible decisions
When I started, I quoted Lee Iacocca's comment on the illusion of knowledge. Now I leave you with a thought from Einstein, who said, Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. I hope you will not return to your same common sense gut feel techniques when you're dealing with serious decisions. If you wish to learn more about the techniques we use to overcome these difficulties, please visit our website www.experters.com. Thank you.